Greetings and, greetings and welcome everybody uh, to another uh, episode of um, a class that's being offered at Holy Apostles College and Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut, entitled Exemplary Practices in Catholic Teaching and Learning. I'd like to uh, welcome our guest speaker today is Father Peter Stravinskas, who is the president of the Catholic Education Foundation and a dear friend. Before we begin with him, uh, Father Peter Kuser, President Rector of Holy Apostles, will lead us in prayer. Father Peter. Name the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom. Pray for us. Pray for us. Name of the Father, and uh, Saint Matthew. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Well, thank you very much, Father Peter Kuser. And Father Peter Stravinska, the floor is all yours. All righty. Well, it's good to be with you all. Um, and uh, I'm, a, as Sebastian knows, I'm a great believer in what I call niche marketing. And so what's the, the niche for contemporary Catholic elementary and secondary schools? And I would suggest there are, it's twofold. The first is a strong, authentically uh, Catholic identity. And the second is employing a classical approach to education. So first I'd like to talk about the identity issue. Um, and feel free to uh, pop in and have with questions or comments uh, because uh, this is a a friendly conversation uh, more than a, a, a formal kind of lecture. So uh, on Catholic identity, uh, as you know, Archbishop Miller uh, had produced that series of benchmarks, uh, but Catholic identity is more than simply a checklist. Uh, how do you know uh, what it is? And uh, here it, may, it might be helpful to, to uh, recall that a uh, silly remark of uh, Justice Potter Stewart from the Supreme Court when he was asked to define pornography. And he said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And, uh, and that's not such a silly answer, really. And, uh, and I would suggest that with Catholic identity, it is, more, and it is something that you know it when you see it, and you feel its absence when you don't. Uh, I visit schools on a regular basis and in, in a very, very short period of time, uh, you can get the feel of the place. And I would suggest that's probably the best word to use. And that's not evasive. It's just, there is something, I, I like to refer to it as Catholic air that we breathe in those institutions. And so uh, it's more than simply having a crucifix and a statue of Our Lady in, in every classroom. That's a sine qua non, huh? That's a no-brainer. Um, but I would start by saying, number one, uh, a Catholic school is a liturgical community. And, and, and that's demonstrated in a variety of ways. Uh, first of all, that the, the seasons of the liturgical cycle are observed. Advent, Christmas, Lent, Easter, uh, the Peranum, the green uh, season. And, uh, and that's demonstrated in a variety of ways uh, by the prayer experiences to which the students are exposed. And, and for example, also by decorations in, in the classrooms, uh, in the corridors, uh, in the entry hall of, of the school. Uh, I was impressed uh, with uh, one school I happened to be visiting during Advent. And the minute you walked in the, the front door of the school, um, an Advent wreath, a very large Advent wreath uh, was in evidence. And the principal informed me that uh, when the kids came back after the Christmas break, there would be the creche there. Um, so it's observing the liturgical seasons. It, it is introducing students to the saints of the church. Uh, we're in a, a, 
a mess of a culture now where uh, heroes are few and far between. And unfortunately, the heroes that most young people latch on to, whether that's uh, from uh, Hollywood or uh, the, the music world or sports, most of those uh, heroes have very, very clay feet. Huh? And, uh, and so if they're imitating that, and, and there is an element in, in youth that wants to imitate, but the church has a 2000 year tradition of, of heroes of the faith. And uh, kids at every level, grammar school and high school alike, love to hear the stories of the saints. I always recommend that part of the morning prayer, presumably over uh, the PA system, uh, include the saint of the day. And if in the general calendar, there is no saint for the day, we can always go to the Roman Martyrology, which has many, many saints for every day, and, uh, and pick out those that would have a particular resonance with the grade levels that, that we're talking about. Uh, thirdly, that the liturgy that we celebrate for the school uh, be beautiful, uplifting, uh, sacred, transcendent, uh, and hopefully we've gotten beyond the era of strum and hum. Uh, there's an entire body of magnificent, beautiful Catholic liturgical music. Uh, and if a kid can go through 12 years or 13 years of Catholic education and not been exposed to that, uh, I would say that that is a very, very serious crime on the part of the educational institution. Um, now, sometimes you hear people say, and what are you talking about? I'm talking about um, Gregorian chant, which Vatican II very, very clearly says is to hold pride of place in liturgical celebrations of the Roman Rite, uh, Renaissance polyphony, and for good measure, uh, some very, very fine Anglican and Lutheran hymns uh, to round out the, the experience. Um, at the high school level in particular, presumably there's a good music department in the school and for student body masses, um, an orchestra, you know, violin, uh, uh, trumpet, organ, all of these things are, are part and parcel of what it means to, to provide a, a good liturgical experience. Sometimes people say, well, I don't know, kids don't go for that. Well, I can tell you, in schools that I ran, uh, you started out small, so you know a curie here and, and a sanctus there. But I would introduce the kids to a curie and be walking through the corridors at change of period and hear the kids singing the curie to each other. Uh, and little kids in particular love to memorize things. Uh, I, I remember going to the Virgin Islands uh, when when now Cardinal O'Malley was the bishop down there, and. Uh, and many of the native people who were functionally illiterate had entire Gregorian and polyphonic masses committed to memory. Uh, so this is something that's very, very doable. And, uh, and if you want to see a tremendous success story with that, I would recommend going to the website of Atonement Academy in San Antonio, which it's, it was saying uh, Our Lady of the Atonement was the first Anglican use parish uh, to come into the church now more than 30 years ago. And uh, I helped them get their, uh, at the time, elementary school off the ground, which then actually morphed into a high school as well. But it's interesting, for example, that the, uh, the eighth grade gift to the senior class is uh, providing the polyphonic mass setting for the baccalaureate mass for the seniors. Um, on another occasion, uh, I, they have uh, Monday, they have mass every day at the school. Monday to Thursday is the Anglican use liturgy, and Friday is the uh, Latin Novus Ordo mass. All the masses there are done ad, ad orientum, that is, priest and people uh, facing liturgical east. And on one occasion, uh, I had the school mass on a Friday, therefore, it was a Latin mass. and. Uh, at the Paternoster, all of a sudden, I heard a, a new set of voices. 
and I thought, I wonder who those are. And then it dawned on me who they were, and it was the kindergartners. And uh, as I stood at the door of the church as the children were leaving, I, and the kindergartners were the last out, I said to the teacher, were these the angel voices I just heard at the Paternoster today? And she said, oh, Father, this was a very special day. This was the first time they were allowed to chant the Paternoster at Mass. And the kids were as proud as could be of, of that accomplishment. Um, we can talk more about uh, you know, some aspects of this if you're interested, but you can certainly go to their website for that. And last but not least, uh, stressing the absolute importance of Sunday Mass. Uh, it's inconceivable to me that a, a student could go to a Catholic school and not go to Mass on Sunday. Uh, and with you know, little kids, there's not much of a way that you can really, quote, force it. With high school kids, it's certainly very doable. And I must tell you that when I was an administrator, uh, the kids were given, uh, if they had three absences in one semester from Sunday Mass, they were expelled. And, um, and of course, you're going to ask, how is that enforced? <laughs> and, uh, and it was done in a couple of different ways. First, everyone had to come into homeroom on Monday morning with a parish bulletin signed by the priest celebrant of the Mass. Now, my mother didn't raise a dumb son. I know that anybody can get a bulletin signed by anybody. So phase two was in religion class. Uh, they had to write on Monday a two paragraph essay on the homily they heard. Paragraph one, what did father say? Paragraph two, what did you think of it? And interestingly enough, I got no pushback from either students or parents. Well, what are parents gonna say? We don't go to church. Uh, but parents came about remarking about it in two ways though, positively. The first group said, thank you for removing a, an additional source of tension in our house. Uh, now there's no more argument on Sunday morning about, you know, get in the car, we're going to church. They know there's a second shoe is gonna fall on that. And the other were parents who said, thank you. You know, we haven't been going in a long time, nothing against it, just got into a bad habit. And thanks for getting us back into a good habit. Um, and uh, with, with little kids, it's obviously uh, something quite different. Um, but, and it's, I'm sure Father Peter would have the same experience. It's, it's very sad when you hear the confessions of little children who tell you they don't go to Sunday mass and you ask why, because my mommy won't take me. And, uh, and so I would say to kids, uh, well, <clears throat> if you wanted to go to the mall and your mother said no, what would you do? Well, I'd ask again. And if she still said no, I'd ask again. And I said, and eventually you probably stomp your feet until she said, let's go. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So your job is very, very simple. From Saturday afternoon at four o'clock until Sunday evening at eight o'clock, you stop. And if they ask you why you're behaving that way, you tell them the priest at confession said, it's not my sin, it's yours. <laughs> and uh, and it, it works, it really, really does. Now, <clears throat> there are also some institutional ways to enforce the, uh, to uh, reinforce the centrality of the Sunday Mass. And that is, for example, on Fridays in, in religion class, uh, to give the students a preview of the Sunday readings. Um, you know, come up with, you know, all the difficult words that might be in the readings, set the context and so forth. You may actually be doing a better job than the homily that they hear. And then on, on Monday morning, uh, simply to say, well, who heard what at Mass on Sunday? What struck you? And so in both of those ways, it's an institutional expectation uh, being set. Next, we want to talk about um, permeation of the curriculum with religious and moral values. Um, a, a Catholic school is, is not a Bible college, it's not a seminary, um, it's a school. And, and so, and we're gonna talk about this more in the 
curriculum side of things. But it's a school that has a unique identity in so much as it is a Catholic school. And uh, therefore, Christ is the center of everything that we do and say. And I always look at it as a kind of a, a wheel, and the hub of the wheel is Christ and the truth of the Catholic faith, and all of the subject areas as uh, spokes on the wheel that all lead back. They start from that center and they go back into that center. Uh, and therefore, there's no aspect of learning in a Catholic school that's off limits for application to one's life in Christ. Uh, for example, uh, I, I taught high school English for a number of years. I don't know how you can teach literature without adverting to the religious dimension of the human person. Um, or uh, in, in, I always told my religion teachers, I don't want you to spend an inordinate amount of time in religion class on the abortion issue. No, 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 no. I want that discussed when they're studying biology and they're doing a unit on fetology or genetics. There is the time to say, now, see what science teaches us? That this being in the womb is a human being. And because the church takes science seriously, she says, therefore, you cannot destroy that life. Uh, I visited a high school in one of the high schools in the Gaylord, Michigan Diocese, a number of years ago. And I, of course, these visits are unannounced, at least theoretically. And uh, I walked into a science room and the teacher uh, kind of was taken aback. I always say priests and teachers are very much alike. They, uh, they hate being evaluated. And um, at any rate, the teacher said, oh, and she was handing out some papers to the students and she said, uh, Father, last week we just finished the unit on genetics. And so today we're going to be studying Cardinal Ratzinger's document, Donum Vitae. Perfect, absolutely perfect. Exactly what we should be able to expect in, in the school setting. Um, <clears throat> and then beyond the classroom itself, just in terms of a, of a mood in, in, in an institution. Um, one of the high schools that I ran was a, a complete mess when I got there. And one of the things you discover in the church is you get a reputation for being Father Fix-It, and you always get sent to a dump uh, to fix, which I don't mind doing, but one of the sad parts is usually after you leave, the problems all reemerge because there's not a continuation of, of the process. At any rate, this school had uh, very bad academics, almost no religious identity. Uh, the god of the school was football and, uh, and not much else. And, <clears throat> uh, and so I was setting to work on these various aspects of the, of the situation. And I got a call one day from a woman who said, I'm a, a graduate student at such and such a university and I have to visit a number of schools this semester and I would like to visit your school. And I thought, oh Lord, that's the last thing I need is to have someone come in and find out how bad this thing is. And so I played off the idea that I was uh, relatively new, getting my sea legs. And I said, you know, call back in a, in, a, in a few months, all right? Well, she took me up on my word and she called back in about two months and she said she wanted to come. And I thought it will look even worse, I guess, if I don't let her come. And so I lined her up with some of the stronger teachers for her, her day visit. And uh, somewhere between, I guess, second and third period, she and I met in the corridor at the change of classes. And I said, how's it going? She said, do you know what you have in this school? And I thought, oh Lord, she's found out already. <laughs> and uh, I said, what's that? And she said, the kids here, they really like being here. They like each other and they like their teachers. They're, they're happy, they smile at each other. And I said, well, I would hope so. Now, I took all of this for granted. 
She said, oh no, not where I come from, she said. The kids don't like each other. They don't like their teachers. They don't like being there. And she said, there's something, and she was a Christian woman, not Catholic, and she said, I, I sense a lot of Christian joy here, which, again, I was very, very close to the situation. I knew it could be better than it was, and I was perhaps missing out on a very essential element of life in a Catholic school, that it's epitomized by a sense of, of, of Christian joy. Something else in terms of atmosphere. Um, I was giving a, a, a teacher workshop in the Archdiocese of Miami a couple of years ago. And uh, I said, you know, a couple of practical things you can do. I said, for example, um, uh, you're in a fourth grade math class and an ambulance goes by. And, uh, and you say, boys and girls, put your books down for a second. Um, let's pray for the sick person and let's pray for the medical people that are going to take care of that sick person. Or you're in uh, freshman algebra and the church bell tolls for a funeral mass. Um, folks, let's take a moment to pray for the repose of the soul of the deceased and for the consolation of his family. And a teacher in one of the first rows started crying. And I thought, what did I say? And I, and I said, is there a problem? And she said, oh no, Father, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. She was not doing it, not because she was opposed to doing it. It had never dawned on her, uh, which brings me to another point. When the faculties in Catholic schools were composed predominantly of religious, particularly religious women, and, and clergy to a lesser extent, but there visibly as well, um, there was a kind of inbuilt system of uh, passing on what we mean by Catholic identity. Uh, it was caught, not taught. Uh, even the very, very large grammar school that I went to in Newark, New Jersey, we had five sections of every grade, and there were usually at least three sisters to two lay teachers, and, and a lay teacher was teamed up with a sister uh, to learn the ropes of, of this kind of thing. Uh, that doesn't exist for the most part anymore. And so there needs to be a, a conscious presenting of this type of, of formation of teachers. And, uh, and this is not 1975 anymore. If I had been saying some of these things that I'm saying to you today, uh, 30 years ago, I either would have been you know, laughed out of the, the lecture hall or, or worse. Uh, the majority, vast, vast majority of the lay teachers that we have today are, are very, very fine people good, serious Catholics making a, a tremendous sacrifice to be where they are. Uh, and if they're not doing things that are explicitly uh, reinforcing Catholic identity, it's generally not malice, it's just ignorance in the, in the root Latin sense of, of the word. So I think that's important to keep in mind. And, uh, and all of the church documents on formation of Catholic school teachers talk about the need for ongoing formation. It's not a one-shot deal. It's something that happens on a regular basis. And it happens through faculty workshops. It happens to, through recommended or required reading and, and so on. Um, but Catholic identity is also apparent <clears throat> in, in the art. And again, um, not cheap, junky stuff, but good sacred art. Let's remember, uh, we're the church that gave the world uh, the, the works of, you know, Michelangelo and Giotto and Fra Angelico and uh, Caravaggio. And our young people ought to be introduced to these master artists and the works that they produced. And, uh, and so, what kind of art is in the corridors of the school? Uh, it should be, you know, beautiful works of art, and also with little identifying uh, captions, so that if a kid happens to stop one day to look at this and say, hmm, I wonder where that came from. And again, this is part of the, the overall enculturation process that, that should be going on. Uh, and then discipline, 
uh, is critically important. Huh? Uh, there's no learning that's possible without discipline. And, uh, and that doesn't mean uh, you know, keeping people in, in mortal fear. I always get very, very annoyed when I hear people talk about, oh, in the old days, boy, the nuns beat the heck out of you. And I went to Catholic schools for 13 years with three different communities of religious sisters in two different dioceses. I never saw anybody beaten up. Uh, now, the Sisters of Charity that I had from kindergarten through uh, fifth grade, Mother Seton's sisters, uh, they had a paddle on the front bulletin board and it said the Board of Education applies to the seat of the pants. And, uh, and we had huge classes. My smallest class was 68 kids in, uh, in eighth grade and that nun was the principal. <laughs> and, uh, but a kid would start to misbehave and sister would simply reach for the paddle. And the kid would say, no, stir, no. And she said, all right, settle down. And that's how we handled ADD in those days, huh? There were no drugs, there were no psychiatrists for it. It's just a discipline that was external that gradually became internalized. Uh, <clears throat> in third grade, uh, uh, Sister Vera was in her 80s when she taught us and she frequently left the room I have no idea for what necessarily, but, but she would say, all right, now boys and girls, you're on your honor. I don't want anybody to talk while I'm out of the room. Imagine leaving even two kids in a room today without an adult, huh? <laughs> and uh, she said, however, if unfortunately one of you speaks, realize two things. One, your guardian angel is gonna be very, very sad. <laughs> And secondly, I want you to go to the blackboard and put your initials on the board for detention after school. And, you know, invariably a kid talked and, and if the kid didn't go put his initials on the board, the other kids around him would go. And just by peer pressure, <laughs> the kid would run and put his name on the board. And then sister would come back into the room and look at the list and she'd say, Oh, oh, I'm so disappointed. Well, not with those five children who have their initials on the board, but the other five who did speak and didn't put their names on the board. So I'm going to go out and let you be, let you please your guardian angel better, and you got another chance to put your initials on the board. And probably 10 kids would go up, some of whom didn't even speak, and put their names on the board. But the point being that, what was that training? It was training in ultimately self-discipline huh? and uh, and the discipline that we practice in a catholic school needs to be fair and it needs to be consistent uh, and i mean this is a matter of justice not charity it's a matter of justice uh, and that number one we never have rules on the book that we don't intend to enforce uh, because the worst thing you can do for discipline in, an, in that environment is to let people know that we do have rules and they're not going to be enforced and therefore what's going to happen everything is going to go up for grabs um, i also have always had a policy of handle handling things when they're small so they never get big uh, i'm a great believer in dress code and uh, in schools that i had i would stand at the front door of the school every morning starting with day one and have a pad of pink detention slips and got the nickname the pink the pink panther uh, and uh, i said this is um uh that you have uh, an understanding that handle stuff when it's at that level and there's never a bigger problem and in one of the schools i inherited uh, i always had a policy i never wanted dances that required a date. Uh, I think uh, the dating in the Catholic scheme of things <clears throat> means preparing for marriage. And, uh, and I hope that a sophomore in high school is not preparing for marriage. Uh, but in this one instance, again, you inherit a schedule, at least for a year when you go to a new place, and they had a so-called winter formal, which took place during the Christmas break. And, uh, and so I happened to be in the corridor. I always learned an awful lot about what was going on in the school two ways, actually. 
walking through the corridors and also taking freshman boys to basketball and football games in my car and let them talk. And I would find out what was going on in all their classes. Uh, and then the teachers would be amazed when I confronted them on Monday about it. Uh, at any rate, in this one instance, there were two uh, freshman boys uh, walking about three feet ahead of me. And I always say that teenagers are like senior citizens. They talk loud thinking nobody can hear them. And, uh, and the one little guy said to the other, <clears throat> um, are you going to the dance uh, next week? And he said, no, I guess, I don't know. And freshman boys are not really interested in this. Freshman girls are, but not freshman boys. And, uh, and he said, well, do you have a date? I'm well, I, I think so, I think so. And he said, well, did you, did you buy a, a flask? And the kid said, flask, what, what are you talking about? He said, stupid, you get a flask and you fill it with vodka or gin and you put it in your suit jacket. And during the time of the dance, you take a swig every so often. And the other kid said to him, are you crazy? If Father Sherlock, that was another one of my names, gives you detention for the wrong color tie, could you imagine booze? And I put my hand on each guy's shoulder. They turned around and looked, and I said, you know he's right. But what had the kid picked up? If he's going to enforce something about a color of a tie, don't even go near the other stuff. And it's really what we see our Lord practice in the Sermon on the Mount. The, the, the Jewish expression for it is uh, building a wall around Torah. And that's what our Lord does in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you've heard the commandment, don't kill. Don't even get angry. You heard the commandment, don't commit adultery. Don't even have lustful thoughts. And we need to do that type of thing in terms of discipline in our schools. Deal with the little stuff and you never get to the big stuff. And that the discipline be consistent. Um, so it's not, I, I had an incident with one kid that there was a teacher that we had who was, he was academically good and he was a good man and a good Catholic, but his discipline was horrific. I mean, you could hear his class uh, corridor away because of the nonsense that he tolerated. And then one day he just absolutely exploded at this kid and sent him down to my office. And as the kid was leaving the room, he said to him, who spit in your cornflakes this morning? <laughs> and the kid came to me and I said, well, why are you here? And he said, well, Mr. So-and-so sent me down. And I said, what did you do? And he said, I don't know. I don't think I did anything different from what I've done for the past two months. And so I got the teacher in later in the day and he said, he said, well, Father, enough is enough. And I said, but the problem is you've given them the message for three months now that anything goes. And so the kid's you know, snarky little remark to you about spitting in your cornflakes that's a legitimate question for him to ask at this point. So, and then also when I say that it'd be fair that we don't play favorites, um, that, you know, the kid of the, the president of the school board doesn't get away with murder, um, that someone who has more money uh, or the reverse kind of, of, of uh, inconsistency, uh, because the kid comes from a bad uh, family background, we give him more leeway than other kids. And kids are very, very, very sensitive to the issue of fairness. Uh, and if they see that discipline is being meted out fairly, they have very little room to complain and, and generally appreciate it. But also they know what the parameters are and that they can work uh, within, it, within those parameters. So, um, I would like to highlight for you, and you can go to our website uh, for the Catholic Education Foundation, um, of which the great Dr. Sebastian is a board member. Um, but we have, we produced about seven or eight years ago, a Catholic school's identity assessment. And I would encourage you to go there and take a look at that and see what, what we have in mind. We, excuse me, the website is catholiceducation.com foundation.
and I think it's under projects. Is that right, Sebastian? That the uh, uh, the assessment instrument is uh, is described. Sure. And, do you want me to bring? Do you want me to bring it up on the screen? You wish. Okay. Um, so Catholic Education Foundation, and I'll share my screen. Um, so there is the uh, website. You'll see it come up in a moment. There you go. Now um, I'm going to scroll down. Now look at this beautiful piece of work here, Father. Um, and I'm scrolling down to where did you say? Uh, projects. I think it's. So I mean. That's the. That's by the way something else that we produce is the uh, Catholic Educator. It's a quarterly, and it pulls together articles from a a wide variety of sources, all dealing with Catholic schools in different ways. So there's uh, Catholic yeah. rural identity assessment. There you are, yeah, good. Uh, <clears throat> so any, uh, before we move on to the, the classical curriculum, any comments uh, about issues of Catholic identity. I mean, you know, we have an entire course on that uh, that's available, but, uh, but at least for a beginning conversation. Oh, and um, if you're muted, uh, in order to speak, you'll have to unmute. Yes, Dr. Tulin is muted. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're still. Yeah. yeah, she has to unmute herself. There we go. I can try to unmute her. Mm -hmm. There mm. you go. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Your, your tongue has been loosed. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I think the things you are talking about, about uh, identity, is something that. Um, is very important. Uh, I'm a convert, and when I was converting with uh, Father Stanley Smolensky, he said, uh, whenever I heard an ambulance, and I was young, I was only in my 30s, and he said, whenever you hear an ambulance you, or a fire truck, anything like that, and where I live, this helicopters go overhead to the hospital, immediately say Hail Mary for anybody who's in that situation. And I never forgot that. So I was already in my 30s. So I can imagine what a dramatic impact that would have on children. Sure. And it, of course, it, it also teaches them, you know, solidarity and suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and the, the power, the importance of intercessory prayer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and again, this goes to that mantra, these things are caught, not taught. Uh, yes. Yeah. People mm -hmm. re remember that kind of stuff as, and you, you remember this from the age of 30, but as you say, yeah. if this is part of your DNA growing up, uh, mm -hmm. you do this kind of thing. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not unlike the situation where, you know, we used to say you could always tell a Catholic in a movie theater because mm -hmm. before he went into the, uh, into his row, he would genuflect. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> And, uh, and I see this, uh, I get a kick out of this. I, I do the food shopping for our community. And, and uh, when, when I'm in the, and if I go to the supermarket, normally I do it in the morning, but if I'm there in the afternoon, I can always tell who the practicing Catholics are because although it's three o'clock in the afternoon, they say, oh, good morning, Father, how are you? <laughs> Which means that's they're used to that Sunday morning greeting. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but these things are, uh, I mean, we can, we can laugh about them in a good way, yeah. uh, but they're indications of, of a culture. And, uh, and there is a, a culture that ought to exist, an ethos in a Catholic school. And, uh, and that that then carries itself on. Uh, as a seminarian, I worked uh, in a parish uh, in the Trenton diocese that had just started. The diocese was the first in the country really to have a consistent pre-Cana program and with certain mandatory meetings and topics and so forth. And that was in the, uh, in the mid seventies. 
and uh, and the pastor said, uh, why don't you be responsible? It was a large parish. I had about 250 weddings a year. And he said, I'm not going to sit with 250 couples during the course of a year doing these interviews. Uh, you do the initial interview. And so that was my job on Friday evenings, uh, had them stacked up seven, eight, and nine o'clock and interview the guy and the gal separately. And I could always tell a guy who had gone to Catholic school by the way he related to me and to the rectory office. If, if the kid came in, if the young guy came in and uh, sat rigidly and looking up and down to the side, I said, mm -mm, never went to Catholic school. Conversely, a kid, a guy would come in and he'd say, hey, Padre, how you doing? And he'd you know, cross his legs and say, can I light up? No, you can't. Okay. It was a comfort level that was there that was very, very clear. And I see that all the frequent flyer miles that I've amassed over the years, uh, a half a million just on United, by the way. And, uh, and but I'll sit down in, in an, on an airplane and if the person next to me says, hi, Father, um, where do you, and a conversation starts, you know immediately the person has been part of of our system from childhood. And again, there is a certain comfort there. It's also important from another angle. And that is, if there's a, a youthful falling away from the church, what brings them back is not the doctrine of the Trinity. It's the sense of belonging to a community of faith. And they miss that. Uh, very often I'll give uh, school kids what I call my tour of Catholic New York. And I always say to the teachers and principals, I want the kids to be in uniform the day that we're doing this for a lot of reasons. Uh, but first of all, it's just easier to deal with. You can see where they are. Uh, but also as an advertisement for the church. And it's amazing. In a place like New York City, invariably, a number of people will come up and say, Oh, it was so beautiful to see those children in their uniforms. It brought back such happy memories. And, uh, and, so, and then not infrequently, even a tear or two. And, and usually the tear or two is the one that's been away from the church for a prolonged period of time. And so there's even a power of evangelization attached to it all. No? Anything else on the, on the Catholic identity score? Uh, Father, we had one question. Oh, um, what advice do you have for a committed Catholic who finds himself working in a government school, uh, surrounded by people who never did go to Catholic school? Get out as quickly as possible. <laughs> uh, now, it's interesting. Um, I've had a lot of, uh, you know, so-called public school teachers say to me, uh, one woman said, I teach in a public school so that my kids can go to a Catholic school. <laughs> uh, and others who say, um, I, I'm waiting for the 20 year mark. And as soon as I can get out with a pension, I'm gonna go back into the Catholic school system where I got my own education. Uh, there are certainly you know, fine people in the government school system, but they're not able to be fine. They're not able to do what they need to, to do. And the atmosphere is totally toxic. Uh, another hat that I wear is doing the student teacher evaluations for Grand Canyon University, which is an evangelical institution. They've been very, very kind and respectful to me, but it brings me into these government schools, largely in suburbia, where first of all, the discipline is terrible. But worse than that, I was in a, a suburban uh, kindergarten class two years ago, evaluating, <coughs> observing the student teacher. And there was a pile of books on the floor next to my chair and for kindergarten. And the top book was Heather Has Two Mommies, right? already in kindergarten. Right? Uh, so it's, it's an environment that it's, far, far worse than it's ever been. Uh, when my father went to public school in, uh, in New Jersey in the 1930s, it was a, a, 
a largely sort of Protestantized Christianity that was there, but on the moral level, there'd be no problems whatsoever. Uh, they would have exactly the same set of, of moral leanings as, as a Catholic would. But today, it's, it's not only that they're teaching those things, but they're contradicting. And uh, a, 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 a Hispanic man told me his kids are in Catholic school, but he teaches uh, CCD for the uh, public school Hispanic kids. And <clears throat> he said one day, uh, a kid came into the class, fourth grader, and he said, uh, uh, Manuel, you look, you look kind of sad today. What's the matter? And he said, oh, I had a bad day in school. And he said, what happened? And he said, I was taking a math class and, and I started, I make the sign of the cross and the teacher said, don't you ever do that in here. We don't do that in this school. And that's a superstition from your grandmother. <laughs> so again, it's, you know, the intolerance is is really very very damaging, huh? And if kids are taught that from a young age, imagine you know religion is a superstition. Okay, anything else on? Uh, quickly then, because we only have eleven minutes left in showtime here. I want to talk about classical education? Uh, and uh, Sebastian, are you going to have Mary Pat? involved uh, with this at all um with uh with uh, this particular program yeah i don't have it i don't have any plans at the present time but uh happy to uh to reflect yeah, think, on it yeah um mary pat donahue currently serves as the executive secretary for the office of catholic schools for the bishops conference in washington uh but her claim to fame was having taken a absolutely failing uh, Catholic school, uh, St. Jerome's in, in Hyattsville, Maryland, and turning it into a massive success story uh, by introducing a classical curriculum. And, uh, and really what we're talking about here is retrieving our own tradition. Huh? This is, <laughs> uh, ca classical education is, you know, the, the medieval uh, and Renaissance Trivium and quadrivium, and uh, and doing things that uh, you know are not trendy, uh, but that we know are effective. And already in the late fifties, uh, Catholic schools and Catholic school teachers started to get a kind of inferiority complex, um, afraid to to continue doing what they were doing because it didn't quote look professional. Uh, so you know some of the sisters had only a, a certificate from the so-called normal school, which would have been a kind of a teacher's college of two years. And I can assure you, those nuns with a, more, a normal school certificate knew more than most of the nitwits who have doctorates today, right? <laughs> uh, or that we had large classes. Uh, and uh, yeah, we had large classes, but we all learned. And they had you know, very creative ways of, of making sure that you learned. Uh, I want to put in a real point for the importance of memorization. Um, I happen to believe that if you haven't memorized it, you don't have it. You don't own it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we had to memorize all kinds of things, both in grade school and in high school. Uh, I mean, obviously the catechism questions, which by the way, is the way my mother ended up learning the catechism because she had never gone to Catholic school. She had no relationship with the church at the time that she put me in Catholic school. But little Peter had to learn his catechism questions and she had to drill them in it. <laughs> but we memorized the multiplication tables. A public school teacher, I mentioned something about memorizing the multiplication tables. And she said, oh, father, she said, you're really out of the loop, aren't you? Uh, or, you know, cursive writing. Uh, New York City public schools haven't taught cursive writing in 25 years, uh, which happens to be one of the most important ways of young people learning creativity, right? Their own personal stamp on, on, on the way they communicate. Um, but in high school, you know, every year in English class, there was a, 
a Shakespeare play, and we had to memorize a soliloquy from, from each of those plays. The, the Merchant of Venice, I can still remember, you know, Portia's soliloquy. The quality of mercy is not strained. A drop that has gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath, so on. Sophomore year, Sister Stella Grace made us memorize the entire Hound of Heaven, 120 some lines. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. But these are things that, you know, become a part and parcel of, of who you are. Um, <clears throat> and what's, what are elements of this Catholic intellectual tradition? Um, first of all, being exposed to the classics. Huh? Um, one of our problems today is people feel quite comfortable pontificating on any issue uh, thanks to Facebook and Twitter and all the rest. Uh, people who are totally ignorant uh, are not embarrassed to demonstrate their ignorance. In fact, very often are proud of it. Uh, they have a right to say whatever they want to say, all right? Uh, and uh, although they wouldn't feel, and we'd be told they didn't have a right to go into a chemistry class and say that H3O was the formula for water, all right? No, well, that's, that's clear, that's H2O, okay? Um, and, uh, and that two plus two might equal five. Well, of course, one of the Pope's spokesmen said that already. So uh, <laughs> and that, that tells you the level of ignorance. Uh, but you have to read good stuff and then, then you write about it and then you talk about it. There's a process, read, write, and speak. And of course, we got that all backwards, all right? <laughs> yeah. So everybody talks. And, and the other two things just never happen. Uh, but writing and speaking, so unbelievably important. Huh? Um, the importance of, of history, uh, learning history. I'm sure you've seen some of the videos of that guy that goes around to college campuses and, and embarrasses the poor things with, with their ignorance of, of, church, of American history. Uh, a couple of years ago, he went on a campus uh, summer school, uh, asked them, what do we observe on July 4th? <clears throat> well, it's July 4th. Well, what is it? Well, uh, bleh, bleh. Uh, finally, he got someone to say Independence Day. And then he asked the question, uh, well, when did this happen? And one said 1964. And from whom did we gain independence? China. Uh, unbelievable. And these are college kids, right? And uh, and so, it, and then music, art, all of these things are part of it. And <clears throat> specifically, Latin. I'm a firm believer that no American kid will ever really know English grammar until he's been exposed to Latin. <laughs> and I, I visited Mary Pat's school our first year of that classical curriculum. And I happened to walk into uh, first, they start Latin in first grade, which by the way, the time to learn a language is primary school. I mean, that stuff stays with them forever at that point. And the mind is, is very flexible and can absorb an awful lot of material and retain it. Uh, <clears throat> I know the languages that I learned uh, either in grade school or in high school, even if I don't use them that much, they come back very, very quickly. Languages that I learned as an adult, not so much. Um, but at any rate, uh, I walked into a first grade Latin class and, you know, they're not learning Cicero at that time. Uh, that it's, it's baby Latin, but they're learning baby English at the same time. Huh? And so I looked at what they were studying and they do a little conversation stuff. And, and so I looked at this little guy and I said, quit Agis. How are you? And he said, Bene. <laughs> Good. I looked at another kid and I said, quit Agis. He said, optime. I looked at another one. I said, quit Agis. He said, pessime. <laughs> but they were already even acting it out. I mean, and you could tell they enjoyed it. They loved it. Then the second element of this process is critical thinking. And everybody talks about it, but nobody seems to know what it is. I walked into a fourth grade social studies class and I said, what are we studying? And they said, World War II. And immediately the teacher said, now, Father, we just started today, so don't expect too much, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so I said, well, tell me what you know about World War II. Already, 
in just one class, they already knew the Axis and Allied powers and so forth. And I said, but now <clears throat> I have a question for you. Now put on your thinking caps. Um, how did, why did World War II start? And one little guy, again, fourth grade, said, because they didn't end World War I the right way. Wow. Right? From a fourth grader. And of course, that's exactly the right answer. But they had the facts. The first problem in most instances, kids don't even have the facts. And secondly, they know how to interpret the facts and to connect the dots. And so that's what, what we should be looking toward, toward doing. Um, so, uh, with two minutes to go, anything? Well, let me read you something that comes from uh, Thomas Merton, the famous convert monk and poet and who had done some wonderful things uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the 40s and 50s and kind of went off the rails in the late 60s like so many others. Uh, but this is from his his autobiography, Seven Story Mountain. Uh, and he was the child of what, if they were, if he had been older, they would have been hippie parents, but they were of these kind of floating types that he probably lived in three or four countries before the age of 15. And for a period of time between the two world wars, he lived in France. And, uh, and he was uh, probably about 13 or 14 himself at the time. And he, he has three paragraphs that talk about uh, his ob observations of government schools in France, again, in the 1930s. He said, when I think of the Catholic parents who sent their children to a school like that, meaning the public high school, I begin to wonder what was wrong with their, he their heads. Down by the river in a big clean white building was a college run by the Marist Fathers. And of course in Europe, college is, is high school <clears throat> or a residence even. I had never been inside it, but it was so clean it frightened me. But I knew a couple of boys who went to it. They were the sons of the little lady who ran the pastry shop opposite the church of Saint Antonin. And I remember them as exceptionally nice fellows, very pleasant and good. How unlike the products of the Lycée they were. <clears throat> When I reflect on all this, I am overwhelmed at the thought of the tremendous weight of moral responsibility that Catholic parents accumulate upon their shoulders by not sending their children to Catholic schools. Those who are not of the church have no understanding of this. They cannot be expected to. <clears throat> as far as they can see, all this insistence on Catholic schools is only a money-making device by which the church is trying to increase its domination over the minds of men and its own temporal prosperity. And of course, most non-Catholics imagine the church is immensely rich and that all Catholic institutions make money hand over fist and that all that money is stored away somewhere to buy gold and silver dishes for the Pope and cigars for the College of Cardinals. Is it any wonder, he goes on, that there could be no peace in a world where everything possible is being done to guarantee that the youth of every nation will grow up absolutely without moral and religious discipline and without the shadow of an interior life or of that spirituality and charity and faith which alone can safeguard the treaties and agreements made by governments. And Catholics, thousands of Catholics everywhere, have the consummate audacity to weep and complain because God does not hear their prayers for peace when they have neglected not only his will but the ordinary dictates of natural reason and prudence and let their children grow up according to the standards of a civilization of hyenas. A civilization of hyenas, right? If that doesn't say it all right there, huh? And it's interesting when I do parish homilies about the importance of Catholic schools, and I always end with this series of, of paragraphs from Merton, that's one of the first things that people take exception to. <gasps> How could you say that about our wonderful public school, right? Well, that's exactly what it is. And, and so, and that's another point, I guess, particularly clergy have to be a little bolder about saying why a Catholic school is important. So <clears throat> it's not something, it's not simply that we do a few things better. 
it's an entirely different, disparate approach from everything that goes on in the other institutions, all right? And, and, if that's, and if we can't say that with honesty, then we need to do one of two things, either fix it or close it up. Because otherwise, we're, we're engaged in fraudulent uh, advertising, okay? So either it is or it isn't. And uh, I think it's probably where we ought to leave it. Anything else? Uh, uh, thank you so very much for being with us today. Uh, uh, do we have room for a final question from anybody? As they used to say in the wedding ceremony, speak now or forever hold your peace. Huh? No, no, they'll, they'll get me on the discussion board. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for your kind attention and, and thanks, Sebastian, for the invitation. Certainly, Father. Uh, well, let's close with a quick prayer. Uh, Cynthia, would you uh, take, us, uh, take us home, Cynthia Tula? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you, Father Peter. God bless you and have an, have an excellent afternoon. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Yes.